Good morning, everybody, to the third Functional Medicine Grand Rounds at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, sponsored by the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. And I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Robert Hodea, who's a longtime colleague and uh, expert in the field of functional medicine psychiatry. And he's been um, practicing for over, I don't know, decades, <laughs> 60 years. No, he's 107. It really works well, functional medicine. And uh, he's actually a clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University Medical Center, where she's been teaching courses on affective disorders, cognitive therapy, psychoneuroimmunology, and endocrinology. He's a faculty member at the Institute for Functional Medicine and a founder of the National Center for Whole Psychiatry in Chevy Chase, Maryland. And um, he's been pioneering approaches to using a systems-based approach to dealing with mental illness, breaking down some of our thinking about the root causes of mental illness, which are often described through the DSM-5 as a phenomenological, phenomenological approach to diagnosis. In other words, we describe by the symptoms and not by etiology. And as we're understanding the complexity of mental illness, we're understanding that there are many causes for which there are treatment that um, are often overlooked and that functional medicine provides a filter to address those complex causes. So uh, welcome, Dr. Dea, to Functional Medicine Grand Rounds. Thanks, Mark, for the introduction. 107 functional medicine works, right? <laughs> right? Um, I want to really thank the Institute for Functional Medicine and the Center for Functional Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. This is a fabulous opportunity. I really appreciate the opportunity to pass on some of what I've learned. I've been doing functional medicine uh, in psychiatry since the late 90s, and I have no questions about its efficacy. And over the years, more and more evidence has accumulated. And as you'll see, we're, we're not going to be able to cover all the evidence today, obviously. It's, uh, the, the field is very rich. Um, so we're going to start uh, by going over our learning objectives. Today we're going to identify the limitations of the current standard of care model for the treatment of depression. We're going to then talk about nutritional, hormonal, and gastroimmunological underpinnings of depression. And then we're going to talk about, through the course of the presentation, about some of the evidence-based interventions that we can use in depression. So the, the current treatment model involves genetics. It involves attachment theory, early childhood relationships, learned helplessness, role disruption, social defeat, neurochemistry, and as a result of these different uh, lenses with which we look at depression, we come out with different treatments. And these treatments have developed over the years, and we have some treatments that seem to be reasonably effective, like cognitive behavioral therapy and psychopharmacology we, we thought was pretty effective. And, uh, but the question now that I'd like to first address is really now that we've been doing this for at least two decades, and really more, how effective is the current treatment model? That answer began to trickle in in 2007 when the STAR-D trial, which was sequenced treatment alternatives to relieve depression, when that was published in 2007, it was pretty much a shock to the psychiatric community. And what they found, what they did, first of all, is they tried to mimic a real-life clinical situation. So people come into the clinic, and they get treated for depression, and they'll be treated with a medication. And if that doesn't work, then you'll add on another medication, or you give them psycho, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. If that doesn't work, you might add another medication from a different class. So if you're using an SSRI, you might use, instead of a, a serotonergic medication, you might use a noradrenergic medication. And then the last step might be that you would add two medications. You might augment with lithium or thyroid hormone. So that was the STAR-D trial, a very uh, good attempt to mimic what happens in the clinic. And it was about 3,600 people, 24 centers, a very well done study. And the results were, that only 50% of the people treated with the standard model had a remission of their depression, and 50% of those relapsed within a year. So we were left with 25% had long-term remission rate with a standard of care model. That's remission, that's not recovery. Remission means that if your, let's say your Beck depression inventory is 30, and it normal is under 10, so if you're 30 and you go to 15, 
you're considered to be someone in remission, even though you still have a low-grade depression. That's remission. It's not full recovery. So the remission rate is 25%. Full recovery rate is lower. That's the efficacy of our current treatment model. In 2008, a year after the STAR-D study came out, a, an article was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine by uh, Eric Turner, which was really uh, a second nail in the coffin, I have to say, because it showed that the evidence base uh, was flawed. So if you were a clinician, a primary care physician, reading the literature, you'd say antidepressants really work well. Turns out that out of 74 FDA-approved studies, only the positive studies were published. Okay, the drug companies held back these studies. Another piece of evidence that our model isn't working is polypharmacy. Before 1980, in the general psychiatric community, 52% of the patients were subject to polypharmacy. By the decade of the 90s, 80% were subject to polypharmacy. And in 2005 to 2006, now a decade ago, one-third of patients, psychiatric patients, were taking three or more medications. Now, the question is, why would this be necessary if the model is working? So, why? The answer uh, has, there are really lots of uh, aspects to the answer. First, we have a biological paradigm. We have the neuronal doctrine where we believe that uh, depression is primarily caused by, we act as if it's primarily caused by serotonin deficiency or noradrenergic problem, et cetera. We have the pharmaceutical industry advertising. We have healthcare model that is allowing less and less time for us to be with our patients. But what I want to focus on today is the fact that our, our molecular environment has changed. We have endocrine disrupting chemicals. We have over a thousand new to nature chemicals that are polluting our environment. So uh, for example, it's uh, tributyl tin is in our environment. It comes, it's in paint, and it's used to uh, avoid a foul smell in paint, and it now shows up in seafood. And what it does is it dissociates the CRH stimulus from the hypothalamus from the pituitary ACTH stimulus. So it, it disrupts the, the uh, endocrine axis. That's one of the axes that is very important in mood disorders. In addition, our food supply, while it has grown and we're feeding more of the world, the nutrient density of the food is diminished because of how it's grown. We need fertilizers, the soil is depleted, etc. The American diet, as we all know, has changed. It's not what it was 60 years ago. It's, it's high fat, saturated fat, sugar, salt, etc. Fiber is down, etc. So that's changed. And we also are bathed in antibiotics, so our microbiome has changed, and there are lots of consequences to that as well. So what I'm saying here is that depression uh, today is not the same as it was 50 or 60 years ago. We have new causes of depression. Uh, this is just an article from the, uh, the Endocrine Society talking about endocrine disrupting chemicals. And I should mention at the end of the slide presentation, there are references for many of these articles that I'm talking about. In this, in this uh, article, they talked about how the endocrine disrupting chemicals affect serotonin, they affect dopamine, they affect steroids, they affect estrogens, they affect all of the endocrine organs and neurotransmission. Bottom line, all this evidence tells us uh, what Tom Insel said is that these antidepressant medications appear to have a relatively small effect in patients classified as having depression. At a biological level, depression likely comprises scores of different disorders, much like pneumonia, right? Pneumonia is not one disorder, it's a syndrome. You can have fungal pneumonia, mycoplasma pneumonia, et cetera, et cetera. Depression is the same. So, uh, we're dealing now not with a simplistic idea of what depression is any longer. And this is a, a graphic uh, to illustrate a variety of the disorders that lead to mood disorders. And this is how you need to be thinking when you're looking at someone with depression. So we're going to go through some of these today. But my main point with this section of the talk is that depression is a syndrome whose underlying causes have expanded. Okay, that's not what it was 60 years ago. Yes, 
Early childhood is important. Yes, trauma is important. Yes, helplessness is important. Cognitive behavioral therapy is good. Even medications have a role. I am not sitting here telling you medications don't have a role. They have a role. But they cannot touch some of the things that we are dealing with. Therefore, I believe that the early studies showed great efficacy for antidepressants, but the later studies are not holding that promise, not, not living up to that promise, and part of the reason is the environment, the chemical soup we're in is different. So today we're going to touch on some of the things. We're going to talk a little bit about comorbidity and depression, about nutrition, about hormones and inflammation. This is a graphic illustrating some, not all, of the conditions that are comorbid with depression. So let's talk a little bit about these. Alzheimer's disease. Here's a study from Cellular Molecular Neurobiology 2014. Wow. Wow. Mood disorders are a moderate to high risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. 30 to 50 percent of your patients with depression develop mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, 30 to 50 percent. That means that every depression your patient has is an insult to the brain and it's activating underlying biological mechanisms that are in common with Alzheimer's disease that happen over the decades, right? So every episode. Let's look a little bit about at diabetes. So diabetes, if you have depression, your risk for diabetes is double to almost 10 times as great. Uh, so, so again, that points to commonality of underlying mechanisms. Coronary disease, as an independent risk factor for coronary disease, depression confers a risk greater than that related to smoking. Who would have thought that? Okay, so now expand your concept of depression. Depression is a symptom and it reflects this iceberg under the surface that you have to pay attention to. Where are we now? With the current model, we have limited recovery, we have comorbidity and chronic illness, and we have quality of life problems, right? We know a, a, a child who grows up in a household with a, a parent who's depressed has a higher risk of many medical disorders. They don't function as well in school, right? There are, there are downstream effects. And we have a cost crisis, right? A chronic illness cost crisis. So what we're going to do today is look at some of these elements that are underlying depression, the newer elements. This is not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So this is a graphic that kind of illustrates the different nodes or organizing systems that we use to think about these new causes, uh, newly discovered causes of mood disorders and depression. So we have here, I'm going to try to use this mouse here for the audience at home. Uh, oops. Okay. So here we have at 1 o'clock we have depression, um, I'm sorry, digestion, nutrition or assimilation, energy regulation, toxicity, detoxification, structural mechanical issues, neuroendocrine issues, genetics, epigenetics, inflammation, immune function, infection, and of course cognition in the psyche. These things all affect mood disorders, emotional function, spiritual function. And that's where we look with functional medicine and how these things come together. And of course each of these nodes or domains or organizing systems influence each other. This is uh, something you've probably seen, the functional medicine matrix, an excellent tool to use in your clinic. Uh, and this demonstrates in, the, in this corner, this, this box over here is where we're going to be paying attention today. Uh, and this is a simplified version of the previous slide. And as you see here, all of these factors that are outlined affect mental function and depression. In the bottom of this form, we have modifiable, modifiable patient lifestyle factors, sleep, nutrition, stress, et cetera, that you can organize your thinking uh, and at a glance really take a look at what's going on with your patient and plug into the different points on this form the things that you learn through your history, your physical, and your lab evaluation uh, so that you know what systems are primarily involved. And we'll be doing that with the cases here today. So let's start by talking about nutrition. For those of you who are interested, which should be all of you, 
uh, nutrition affects brain function. This is a paper, it's actually a two-part paper, uh, published in the J Journal of Nutrition, Health and Aging in 2006 on the effects of nutrients on the structure and function of the nervous system. Excellent review paper for people who are interested. So let's go into nutrition a little bit, and before we do, I want to start with a case that will demonstrate the nutritional factors that operate in mood disorders. This is an interesting case. This is a guy, this is actually not his picture, okay? This was lifted <laughs> from the internet. Uh, this is a guy who I, was one of my first patients in 1983. And, uh, I mean 1883. <laughs> it's one of my first patients. And he was just discharged from the hospital with panic and depression. He was in the hospital. In those days, he stayed in the hospital for a long time. He was in the hospital for a month. He came out, and uh, I treated him with Nardil, which is an MAO inhibitor, and cognitive behavioral therapy, which at the time was cutting edge, and group therapy, and he did actually quite well. And so when Prozac came out, fluoxetine came out in 1988, uh, I switched him over because he wouldn't have to deal with dietary restrictions from the MAO inhibitor. Um, he did very well, and actually did very well for about nine years, and then in 97, he got married and had some kids. He married a woman who had, child, had been abused as a child. And we know that that's associated with increased risk of mental health and, and physical problems later on in life. Sure enough, after a couple of kids, by 2003, his wife developed fibromyalgia, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. His father died. He was a chef. He had to leave his career. He had to uh, go into his father's retail store and take that over, and he had to take care of his mother, who was actually a little bit bipolar, and uh, basically his life had turned upside down. So what do you do in a situation like that? You stress eat, right? Twinkies, they're very good, right? They so They're very good. <laughs> this is what he did. So what happened? By 2005, he had gained weight. He had reflux. Uh, so he went to his primary care physician and put him on omeprazole. Since the, re since the omeprazole relieved his symptoms, he could continue to eat, and he continued to gain weight. By 2007, he had weight gain and continued, and he had metabolic syndrome. And he was now dysthymic. He was beginning to have some of his depression. By December of 2008, his panic attacks started to come back and his depression <laughs> worsened. And now he insisted that he had Prozac poop out. How many of you remember that, right? He was sure he needed another medication, but having been working in functional medicine at that time for almost a decade, I knew that if something is working, medication is working for all this time, it doesn't just stop. There have to be other factors. So I was unwilling to go on the medication merry-go-round with him. So now I'm going to put a pause on this case and we're going to talk a little bit about nutrition and depression and some of the evidence that we have that it's relevant. And then we'll come back to this case after that. Uh, just to show you, this is how I uh, populated his, this is actually partial, but this is how I populated his matrix. You see under the person, he's a chef, he had to become a retail store owner, he had panic, anxiety, dysthymia, and uh, when I first evaluated him for this deterioration, he had insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. Hemoglobin A1C was 5.9. And he had GERD, Prilosec, and uh, then I put psychosocial factors down there. So this is where we're looking on the, the functional medicine matrix. And here's what we're going to focus on today. Let's start with tryptophan and tyrosine. Now, we're not covering macronutrients, which are also very relevant in mood disorders and mood stability. Uh, we're going to focus on some of the micronutrients uh, today that, that are useful and there's good evidence for. So let's start with tryptophan and tyrosine. Uh, there are studies called tryptophan depletion studies and tyrosine depletion studies. And what they do, let's say they take 100 people who have responded to SSRIs. Um, and they put them on a liquid diet, and it's double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled studies, and been repeated many, many times. They put them on a liquid diet, and they take tryptophan out of the liquid diet. On the fourth to sixth day, 60% relapse into depression. 
They haven't changed anything, okay? They put it back in blindly, double blind, I should say. Four to six days later, they pop out of the depression. So that tells you two things. One is, and we're not going to talk about this, how come only 60% relapse? What's going on with the other 40%? That's a separate story. But that tells you that if you don't have the raw materials to make the neurotransmitters, like tryptophan, you can't have a response to the medication, right? This has been repeated over and over. Now, if you're on an SSRI, you take tryptophan out, that's what happens. If you take tyrosine out, nothing happens. If you're on Welbutrin, bupropion, and you take tyrosine out, same thing happens, but if you take tryptophan out, it doesn't happen. Okay, so we know raw materials are necessary, so that there are many raw materials that are necessary. We're gonna talk about some of those. And I should also say, that there are lots of reasons why tryptophan might actually be low. It could be your diet. It could be you're not getting enough protein. It could be you're not digesting your protein. Maybe you're on a pro proton pump inhibitor. Maybe you're 60 years old, you're not really making the digestive enzymes. M maybe you have bacterial overgrowth of your small intestine. Uh, maybe you are absorbing the tryptophan but is being shunted down a different pathway so that you really can't use it, and we're gonna talk about that. Lots of reasons, but you need adequate tryptophan to go down into 5-HTP, which goes into serotonin, which then goes into melatonin. That's essential. Okay, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, in particular EPA, icosapentaenoic acid, that's what you need to give to every patient who has a mood disorder. Okay, not, not really a question. Um, the evidence is very strong. Uh, actually, just in 2016, in June, there was a, uh, a review article in the American Journal of Psychiatry reviewing uh, the adjunct adjunctive treatments for mood disorders, and EPA, eight randomized controlled studies, double-blind, show a significant effect size, and the, the remember, it's EPA, not DHA, okay? It's EPA. Okay, EPA, uh, actually just last week another study came out that said uh, the actual most effective dose is 1.8 grams per day. This review that you have up on the screen says it's between one and two grams. In the old days, people said it was as much as 18 to 20 grams a day. We now know that's not true. So about 1.8 grams of EPA per day. It's a slam dunk, okay? It's gotta be. Now. Another slam dunk is vitamin D and depression. Meta-analysis of all studies that were without flaws showed a statistically significant improvement in depression with vitamin D supplements when it's needed. Right? You don't just throw someone on vitamin D, you have to measure their level, and then you have to follow up. After you give them their vitamin D, you follow up. But this is the floor. This is necessary. It may, may not be sufficient. You don't say, hey, you got depression, let me give you some vitamin D and then come back in six months. But you make sure the vitamin D is, is in. So that's a slam dunk. What I want to talk about now uh, is minerals and depression. And in particular, I like to talk about zinc and copper because uh, I think there's a very good database here. Uh, it's important to recognize that zinc and copper are related to each other, right? Inversely related, the higher, more zinc you take in, the lower your copper levels go. Um, I'm not going to talk about iron, calcium, magnesium. They clearly play a role in mood disorders, but we have limited time here. So let's talk about zinc. World Health Organization estimates one third of the world population is deficient in zinc. Now, it's also been established that lower serum zinc is a marker for treatment resistance in depression. And it also relates to the inflammatory, the degree of inflammation in that illness. It's important also to recognize that there are four randomized trials that show that zinc is an effective augmentation strategy for depression, okay? And we'll talk now in a, in a minute about why that is. But don't think of zinc, again, as treatment for depression, but as augmentation, right? It's necessary, not necessarily sufficient. One of the points I want to make is that uh, even if you're eating a diet that has adequate zinc, 
when you go into adolescence, the bone, you're growing. Bones grow, connective tissue's growing. The bones require zinc. The bones take the zinc and get the zinc before the brain does. And so what happens is in adolescence with zinc deficiencies, you'll see normal growth, but you'll see abnormal behavior. And this has been replicated in animal studies, but also some human studies, and, and also in the studies, I've, in what I see in my office. So uh, zinc in adolescence, that's a, a population very vulnerable, as well as the population that has infection and inflammation. So how does zinc work? Well, first of all, it's an NMDA agonist, so it helps, uh, it has an influence on the balance between GABA, which is a calming neurotransmitter, and glutamate, was, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Second, zinc regulates a gene, the TNF-alpha gene, the response of that gene to lipopolysaccharide. Lipopolysaccharide, as you may know, is the envelope of back pathogenic bacteria. All right? And that's what makes you sick when you get a cold, and it's not a virus, but a bacterial infection, and you feel sick. Tiny amounts of lipopolysaccharide will make you feel sick. Zinc regulates the ability of your gene, the TNF-alpha gene, which helps. It's kind of like part of the grand central station of inflammation. It regulates how efficiently that gene works to make cytokines. So zinc is important there in the inflammatory response. It also regulates the toll-like receptors uh, in the prefrontal cortex, toll-like receptors three and four in the prefrontal cortex. And it also modulates the binding of 5-HT, which is serotonin, to the 5-HT1A receptor. There are 14 serotonin receptors. This is one which has been documented to have relevance in mood disorders. And zinc modulates the binding of serotonin by affecting the shape of the receptor. And I have a graphic of that that I'll show you. The last thing, and this is really interesting, is it activates pro-BDNF into BDNF. Now, BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So it's a, it's a molecule that helps neurons grow. Evidence is very strong that when something works for depression, it increases BDNF. It's helping to grow new neurons. Zinc is necessary to convert the precursor molecule, pro-BDNF, into BDNF. So you've got to have it, right? So those are some of the activities. Zinc is localized in areas in the brain that we know are relevant to mood disorders. And here's the graphic I was telling you about. You see zinc. This is the transmembrane serotonin receptor. And uh, you can see here is the ex extracellular part. Here is zinc. And here's the intracellular part. And here's uh, T3 thyroid, triiodothyronine. And here would be the cell membrane. And you see that zinc actually affects the shape and the structure of the receptor so that serotonin can bind efficiently to this 5-HT1A receptor. So in the office, what do you do? I, what I do is I measure red blood cell, zinc, and copper. Some people like plasma. I actually like red blood cell for whatever reasons. There's controversy about the best way to measure zinc. Um, but if you're measuring RBC, zinc, and copper, the optimal ratio is 16 to 1. Important to note that high-dose zinc leads to hippocampal deficiency in zinc. The hippocampus is involved in memory, short-term memory formation, consolidation of memory. So you take a lot of zinc, you have lower uh, levels of zinc in the hippocampus, and that pro-BDNF doesn't get activated into BDNF, and it gets harder to store memory. So too much zinc will worsen memory. So it's very important to treat uh, after measuring, and then measure again at some interval. I measure th three months later. Okay, we're moving on, kind of like the speed of light here. So uh, um, sorry for that, but it's just so much data. Um, let's talk about methylation and mood. Methyl, uh, 
group is a carbon, basically a carbon molecule with three hydrogens that we use to build up and break down, you know, molecules. It's uh, building the skeleton of molecules. So here's a, a chart that uh, I'm always nervous to show because um, it's so complex, and this is actually a simplified version. Um, but let's just kind of look uh, simply. What we have is five cycles here. We have a methionine cycle. We have the folate cycle. We have the neurotransmitter cycle where we make uh, serotonin, and dopamine, and urea cycle, and then down here we have transsulfuration. Now, what you first want to notice is that all these cycles are like gears working together. So what happens if you have gears working together and one gear is slowed down? All of the gears are slowed down, right? So how does this work? In a simple form, what we have here in the folate cycle is 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. There's a lot of people talk about that, and that's one of the, that's the, actually the only form of folate that crosses a blood-brain barrier. And that, along with cobalamin, which is here, will drive homocysteine up through the cycle into meth methionine. Methionine is then converted to SAMe. SAMe, you can buy it in the health food store, right? SAMe is S adenosyl methionine, and it's a methyl donor. SAMe then donates a methyl group, whoops, Okay, Sam E then doesn't want to donate the methyl group today. I'll do this with my cursor here. So Sam E takes a methyl group and moves it right down here, helping to metabolize dopamine and serotonin and convert norepinephrine to epinephrine. Actually, also activates catechol-O-methyltransferase, which is not on this diagram and also helps metabolize estrogen. It's involved in uh, donating methyl groups for DNA synthesis and activating uh, genes, uh, gene expression, et cetera. So this is, this is all a consequence of you know, cobalamin, methylcobalamin, uh, affecting clearly tyrosine and tryptophan. And if you follow this down here to the lower left hand, you see that these things all affect oxidative stress and inflammation microglial activation, neuronal damage, peroxynitrate, superoxide synthesis, all tied together. So a simple molecule like folic acid or, or B12 um, clearly has broad effects. Now, so, so what you have to do is evaluate your patient for this. If you're treating someone for depression, can't ignore this, right? You've got to make sure the underlying foundation for a neurotransmitter function and oxidative, managing oxidative stress. You have to make sure all of this is in order. One of the things we often do is we test for MTHFR. You probably, most of you have heard of MTHFR. Uh, the incidence uh, or the presence of MTHFR SNPs is actually overrepresented in populations with depression. Um, in the general population, we have 24% of the population is homozygous for this SNP. So that means their, their efficiency with which they can use uh, uh, the enzyme, that with, with which the enzyme can metabolize folate, is about 24%. If you only have one SNP in the MTHFR, it's about 66%. So thinking about the gears that we just looked at, you can see that this will have some effect on neurotransmitter production, simply obvious. And we know from the tryptophan depletion study, if you don't have adequate serotonin or dopamine, et cetera, that you're not going to get an antidepressant response, right? So it just simply, just looking at that simple part of methylation, we know that it will have an impact on antidepressant response. And in fact, there are many studies that have shown that. This is a study that shows that the recovery rate, not the remission rate, the recovery rate in, in uh, people who take fluoxetine, Prozac, is greater when you add folic acid significantly greater. So what do we know? Low levels of folate, high levels of homocysteine, which is easily measured, are risk factors for elevated depression and depressive diagnosis. We know that folate supplementation enhances the effectiveness of antidepressants. Actually, there's even a study that it shows it reduces side effects. 
That's one study, though. Let me move on now to B12. Uh, this is just some points I want to make. You saw in the cycle how it works, but uh, how do you assess B12 status? What, what most people do is they measure a serum B12 level. If it's normal, they're happy. Well, here's a study from the Proceedings of Nutritional Society in 2008 that says it's, the evidence suggests that serum B12 is not accurately reflecting intracellularly intracellular levels and therefore function of B12. That's what we care about, right? What's going on inside the cell. So people say, well, let's measure methylmalonic acid instead. That'll give us a functional matter, uh, measure. But here's a study from clinical chemistry that shows that when they look to try to account for the variation in methylmalonic acid, they can only account for 17% of the variation, and B12 is just one of those factors. So throw methylmalonic acid out the window. What do you do? Very simple. CBC, an MCV, look at the MCV, iron indices, homocysteine, etc. So what you're looking for is obviously a macrocytic anemia with B12 deficiency, but the macrocytosis can be hidden by iron deficiency. Right, so that will cause a microcytosis. So you might be left with just an anemia that's normocytic. So as the MCV veers upwards of 90, which is the, the mean or the median, you're going to suspect uh, a B12 issue. However, you have to also look at iron to see if it's masking. And of course, you're measuring homocysteine, looking at meds that they might be taking that might be playing a role. Uh, autoimmunity, do they have pernicious anemia, is that possible? Are they over 50? As you're over 50, your parietal cells have a more difficulty making uh, hydrochloric acid, intrinsic factor, so you can't absorb it as well. Do they have other factors? But, but the, I would say that these four blood tests are very simple, and if you look at them carefully, you can have a dynamic assessment of whether someone needs B12. So the things that I've mentioned are not without risks, and I encourage you to just read this slide over. Uh, you know, just as an example, SAMe can cause switching. You have someone who you think is just depressed, they can switch into hypomania. Or if you use SAMe with someone who's on an antidepressant, they can develop serotonin syndrome. Um, if you use tryptophan in someone who has inflammation, you can make them feel really bad. You need to use 5-HTP, we'll talk about that. Excess vitamin D, kidney stones, etc. So look over this slide uh, and, and know that everything carries its risks. So let's go back now to my first patient. I was able to convince him not to go on the medication merry-go-round. His MCV was 99. I did a functional test of B12 deficiency. His homocysteine was elevated at 14.4. I gave him methylcobalamin IM three times a week for a while. His panic attack stopped within weeks. He agreed to work on his metabolic syndrome by August, about eight months after we started the treatment. He had lost 39 pounds. Hemoglobin A1C had dropped to 5.6. His lipids were still elevated. He, he, he uh, was exercising, and most importantly, He's still taking Prozac and he was doing fine, okay? We didn't have to do the whole medication switch. Let's move on to hormones. And let me say you don't have to remember all this, okay? This is just, <laughs> this is just a, a series, you know, a survey. We're just kind of taking a survey, all right? Hormones, every hormonal system affects the brain. The brain is, in, is a hormonal organ, okay? Um, so this is where you would put it on your matrix. You would kind of put those, the, the symptoms and signs here. Here's a case. This was a fascinating case for me. <clears throat> this was a woman who was highly functioning. Uh, she was actually one of the top youngest female executives in the country. Very high functioning woman, great education. She got pregnant, had a kid, and shortly after she gave birth, she went into depression, but she didn't know it was depression. So for about 18 months, she had no treatment. Finally, after 18 months, she had a panic attack. She ended up in the hospital. Diagnosed with panic disorder, unipolar depression. Later on, she was all, uh, diagnosed with rapidly cycling bipolar disorder. Okay, so the, the, the diagnosis evolved. 
And in her chart, it said borderline hypothyroidism not requiring treatment. She was given a series of medications, and she was also uh, given ECT, shock treatment. And she ended up, when she came to see me, she was on Clozeril, which is an antipsychotic, and it's the only one that's been shown, aside from lithium, the only medication shown to reduce the risk of suicide. So she was on Clozeril, an antipsychotic. Um, she was hospitalized four times and, uh, for suicidal ideation. Terrible. I mean, can you imagine the fall from where she was, uh, the devastation in her life and her family? Uh, she had a strong family history of affective disorders, alcoholism. Her grandmother had ECT. Um, so borderline hypothyroidism not requiring treatment. Uh, when I saw that, I have to admit, I got a little agitated. Why? Because it's very clear, without optimal thyroid function, mood disturbance, cognitive impairment, and other psychiatric symptoms emerge. You cannot, in a patient who's Otherwise, well, fine, you want to watch it, whatever it is you want to do. In a patient with mood disorder, you cannot ignore a borderline TSH or borderline hypothyroidism. So the question is, what's the optimal TSH? Well, the, the NHANE study looked at 16,500 Americans without thyroid disease, and the optimal TSH in the U.S., from 1988 to 1994 was 1 1.5, okay? That's your target. The reference ranges go up to 4.5. If you have a patient with a mood disorder, you can't allow that. Now, of course, you have to go to a physical history, et cetera, but antenna have to go up as you move away from 1.5, as you go north of 1.5. Why is it so important? A lot of reasons, but this is the graphic, again, that I showed you before with uh, the T3 uh, highlighted, and T3 affects the function of the serotonin, the 5-HT1A receptor inside the cell, okay? We can't measure brain levels of T3. Can't do it. We have to rely on history, physical, and uh, lab results. So you can't ignore that. The other thing you can't ignore is estrogen and depression. Estrogens affect all neurotransmitter systems. And uh, this is a study where they looked at the efficacy of uh, bioidentical estrogen for women who had perimenopausal depression, and it was very effective, as effective as antidepressants. Now, I don't know what to make of that because <laughs> we now know that antidepressants may not be so effective, but, uh, but still had seemed to show some efficacy. Let's go to the HPA axis. This is very interesting. Uh, uh, this was a study by Phil Gold from National Institute of Mental Health who showed that, broadly speaking, depression, the HPA axis function in depression, falls into two different categories, high cortisol and norepinephrine and low cortisol and norepinephrine. So I often joke that if I had to go to a desert, desert island with one test for depression, it would probably be this, okay? And you could see on here, let me see if I can get this going. This is the normal diurnal variation. Your cortisol is high at 8 a.m. and it goes down through the day. This is a case of a patient with agitated, melancholic depression. You can see the cortisol is very high. That's one type of HPA axis response in depression. Another type is where the cortisol is actually very low. So this is very important that you know you can't just throw, some people use phosphatidylserine in depression, you can't just throw phosphatidylserine at people with depression because it lowers cortisol, okay? You need to know what you're dealing with. So back to our patient here and the matrix. Uh, we populate the matrix. She had rapid cycling. She had P history of PMS. A Beck depression inventory, which should be under 10, was 29. She was hypothyroid. Her adrenal output was low. Insomnia, migraines. TSH was high, free T3 was low. She had some nutritional deficiencies. So we started out, her Beck depression inventory was 29. We added thyroid, corrected her diet, supported her adrenals. A month later, added some nutrients and got her off caffeine, got her exercising. Then we added melatonin in the third treatment visit. And we had, at that point, done an, a female hormone profile looking at her 
progesterone and estrogen through the cycle. And based on that, I added progesterone 100 milligrams BID, days 21 to 25. And then days 26 to 28, I added 50 BID, and then we stopped. And in January, we were beginning to taper the Clozeril as she was sleeping better. And by February, her BDI was down to 17. She told me how much the fish oil was helping her. And by June, her BDI, her Beck Depression Inventory, was normal. Okay? So here's this woman whose diagnosis was delayed by two years and nine months and spent $53,000 in hospitalization costs and medication costs and psychiatric visits because of the delayed diagnosis. This is something that's not uh, tolerable any longer. The immune system interacts with the brain, so the brain is also an immune organism. I'm going to kind of move through this a little quickly. This is a, a case of John, who was an 18-year-old senior with severe OCD and depression. His Beck depression inventory was 38. His Yale-Brown obsessive compulsive scale is 29. He was depressed, refused medication. He had had therapy. On the, the intake, he had many GI symptoms. He couldn't gain weight. He had chronic headaches. His right index finger was bent. He hadn't, he hadn't straightened his right index finger in two years because he had a superstition that if he straightened it out, something bad would happen. So it was cyanotic. He had, uh, he had a, actually lymphadenopathy, cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, and uh, so there was evidence at the first visit of oral thrush, cervical node sinusitis, and he had lots of GI complaints. The science is very clear that inflammation in the periphery affects the brain by activating microglia, and it steals tryptophan. Remember we talked about tryptophan depletion. This inflammation steals tryptophan. It activates indole dioxygenase, and it steals tryptophan to go into quinolinic acid so the tryptophan does not go into 5-HDP and then serotonin and melatonin. And I have, you can see that on this slide here that the, the uh, tryptophan, which is right up here, should be going down this pathway primarily into serotonin and melatonin. But when you have inflammation, it goes down this pathway down here to quinolinic acid, which activates NMDA and releases glutamate. So now you have this glutamate storm with infection. And think about your patients with infection and inflammation how wired they feel sometimes. They, they're tired, but they're also wired, and they're depressed and they're irritable. Their serotonergic function is depleted, and they have quinolinic acid, and you can measure this in organic acid testing. I counted at least nine evidence, uh, lines of evidence supporting uh, inflammation as a contribution to depression. And obviously, this is not something we cover in one day, but there were a couple of studies I wanted to point out. This is a study uh, from JAMA Psychiatry 2016. This is a study in 7.2 million people in Denmark where they showed that 10% of the suicides in this population were attributable, attributable to infection. And what they did is they found that people who had infections and went to the hospital for infections had a higher likelihood of suicide. And it was a dose-response relationship. The more infections, the longer your hospitalization, the higher your risk of suicide. And they, they removed the confounding variables. It wasn't like, well, they had psychiatric history. They removed those. So 10% of suicides appear to be caused by infection. So the answer is give everyone NSAIDs, right? Wrong, okay? Here are 14 trials that show NSAIDs and cytokine inhibitors actually will reduce depressive symptomatology, but I say to you that first, do no harm, because those are drugs with problems. Let's get to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is where is the inflammation and the infection coming from? Is it stress, or is it mold and toxins, or all the things in between? Is it in the gut? Is it in the lungs? Where is it? You have to find it. When you're treating depression, you look for the source of the inflammation. So we'll go back. Uh, one more thing here, and then I'm going to wrap up. 
is the GI tract and the gut microbiome clearly connect with the brain. There are multiple pathways by which this happens. And I'm going to skip ahead to one slide that, frankly, when I read this, I had a chill go through me. Okay. This is a study in rats where they force-fed diabetic rats glucose, and then they took three strains of their, of their microbiome out, and then they injected them into another group of rats that had a microbiome in the gut that was not diverse, it was very narrow. And what they found is by injecting these three strains, they actually changed the gene expression in the prefrontal cortex that changed the myelination of, of the neurons in the prefrontal cortex. That means that you could have guts, uh, uh, bugs in your gut that are changing how your brain is functioning. Now, we're not at a point where we could say, oh, you're depressed, here, take B. longum's probiotic and you're going to be fine. We're not there. But we are at a place where we know that the microbiome has an effect, a significant effect on people, many people, not all people, but many people with depression, cannot be ignored. So just to wrap up this uh, young man, uh, what we found was his TSH was elevated, but he had five infections, and his serotonin was depleted. At salmonella, chronic salmonella, endolemax, nana, you could read this, and uh, obviously had lots of GI problems. And what happened basically is over the course of three and a half months, we treated his infections, we removed the offending bacteria, parasite, candida, foods, replaced some enzymes in his gut, gave him probiotics, repaired his gut immune barrier with a medical food product. By his second visit, his Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale dropped from 29 to 21, and his Beck depression inventory from 38, I think it was, to 19. Then put him in exposure and response prevention therapy for his OCD. And by his third visit, uh, he was, his anxiety was almost gone. And by his fourth visit, his OCD was, quote, a million times better. And his Beck depression inventory was normal. And this here is my uh, next to last slide. And this, you know, this is just kind of a summary. When I started doing functional medicine, I was so blown away by the effects in my patients. Uh, I'm a psychopharmacologist by training, and what I noticed is I wasn't having to go on the medication merry-go-round. Well, let's try this, let's try this, let's combine, you know, that whole thing. Uh, so I thought maybe I have selective attention to the positive, right? I'm doing all this stuff, I'm excited about it. Maybe I have selective attention. Well, I decided to do a retrospective analysis of my previous 23 cases of treatment-resistant depression. Now, these were consecutive cases. I didn't cherry-pick. 23 consecutive cases. And what I found is that the mean Beck depression inventory when they came in was 34, normal, under 10. These are moderate to severe depressions. And by 10 months, Everybody, except for one outlier, was down to 7.6. Everyone was normalized except for the one. I did not have to change medications. Okay? This is a powerful model. Now, you see it took 10 months. An antidepressant, if it works, takes three weeks. But it takes time because you have to change lifestyle. You have to change diet. You have to change the hormones. You have to let the body heal. Right? This is functional medicine in action, and this, this method works. If you've seen Dale Bredesen, it works. For Alzheimer's, early Alzheimer's and, and mild cognitive impairment, I've used it in those cases. I've used it for osteoporosis. I've used it to reverse type 2 diabetes. I use it in bipolar type 2 disorder. People can be without medication. Bipolar 1 is a different story. This has broad utility. In depression, it's, it's a game changer. So the simple uh, overview here in the, the part of the matrix we covered is correct the diet, assess nutrients and methylation, identify and treat the sources of inflammation, psychosocial, don't forget that, exercise, etc. optimize hormones. And that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Take, uh, if anybody has questions, I'll take some questions. We, we have to wrap. It's a wrap. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Thank you.
Uh, thank you all for coming today. Thank you, those who are watching. We have about 2,700 people watching on live stream today. And uh, I just want to remind you that we have uh, coming up soon the functional medicine uh, <clears throat> case based approach, exploring functional medicine uh, CME event on November 4th, which is an all day event at Cleveland, and we invite you all to come. And we also have the next Functional Medicine Grand Rounds on December 13th with Dr. Alessio Fasano, who is one of the world's experts in gluten and celiac disease and leaky gut, his connection to autoimmunity. And that's going to be on December 13th at the Center for Functional Medicine, our new facility, and Q2, uh, room 157 on the second floor. So we invite you all to come to that as well. So thank you for joining us. And I think you've done a great job, Dr. Dan, explained to us the, the multiple causes of depression that may not be immediately evident. And I remember conversation with Thomas Insel once who said the DSM-5 has 100% accuracy but 0% validity, meaning it describes <laughs> the diseases by symptoms but not by etiology. So thank you for illuminating us today. Thank you.